Everybody good? Joining us tonight, we've got uh, Kristen Cattell. Kristen, introduce yourself, please. Hi there. I'm Kristen Cattell. I'm the office manager for Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, based out of New York City. Happy to be here. Happy Band Books Week to everybody. So first of all, tonight, we want to uh, apologize for broadcasting right before everybody's getting ready for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. We promise we will let you go so that you can get started as soon as the uh, TiVo is going and you can miss the commercials. But uh, right now we're going to talk about the freedom to read, and we're going to talk about our banned books heroes. And so um, I guess we'll... Wow. Joining us tonight, we've got uh, Kristen Cattell. Kristen, introduce yourself, please. Hi there, I'm Kristen Cattell, and the office... There we go, I got it. Live TV, everybody. Live uh, before TV. we get started, I'd like to invite everybody following along on Twitter or on the um, Google Hangout on Air page. Please feel free to uh, ask your questions um, as you post along. We're going to be uh, going to Q&A at about um, 8.15, and um, we're going to talk about what inspires us as uh, we go into Band Books Week. So uh, briefly, Brad, before we went on the air, you showed me um, some heroes that you've got coming out in... Uh, January, and I think that's as great a place to start as any. Can you show us uh, what you're working on and what you're cooking up there? Yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. The, um, so, you know, we were talking off air, and uh, in January we're doing, you know, my, my daughter a couple of years ago was looking for stuff to wear, and all she could find was things with Disney princesses on them. And, and, you know, listen, God bless the Disney princesses, but I just felt like there were so many better heroes I can give her. And so I had Chris Eliopoulos, uh do a little drawing. I said, can you draw Amelia Earhart? And on the bottom, I'm going to write, I am Amelia Earhart. And on the back of it, we'll write, I know no bounds. Um, and then she started wearing them. My wife wanted one. And we just said, you know what? We need to tell their story. So these are what we're coming out with. This is I am Amelia Earhart. And then I am Abraham Lincoln. Um, now, are these comics? Are these uh, picture books? What have we got here? Yeah, you know, what they are is um, they tell the stories and they are. I mean, these are actually not bound. These are the early proofs, but you'll see Chris's work. I mean, this is it. Um, and they tell the story of Amelia Earhart. And what I love um, is that you get to see her when she's a kid. Um, here's some of Chris's artwork, by the way. Totally Chris right there. He put himself <laughs> in the book. Um, but what I love is, is you know, Amelia, I, I, when I talk to my daughter about this, my daughter doesn't care that Amelia Earhart flew in a plane across the Atlantic. Anyone can do that. Everybody does that today. But if I tell her that when she was, you know, a little kid under 10 years old, that Amelia Earhart built a roller coaster, a homemade roller coaster in the backyard, that she took a milk crate and she put roller skates on the bottom of it, she lugged the crate up to the top of her tool shed, and then she put two two-by-fours um, <laughs> at the top of the tool shed, and then because she was like, this isn't going to be fast enough, she put large, she greased the whole thing to make sure she moved, and she gets on the top and she's like, says to her sister, I'm going first, and her sister's like, yeah, you're going first. And basically she takes off down this thing, crashes, wrecks a thing, and then it's like, that's awesome, and it's the first time Amelia Earhart really flies. Now my daughter reads that and she goes, oh my gosh, she's like me. And to me, that's what I wanted the books to be, is not just showing people uh, the stories of famous people, but what we're all capable of on our truly best days. And so, you know, to me, that's really what Band Book Week is about also, right, is focusing on heroes, focusing on people that our kids, that everyone can look up to. That's, that's exactly right. And actually, this year, one of the themes of Band Books Week is Band Books Heroes. And there was some really outstanding heroism in the Chicago Public Schools this year when there was an incident where, believe it or not, there was, they tried to ban Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis which is just absolutely shocking that this memoir about being a young girl growing up in Iran was a target where they tried to pull it out from the schools. Watch this. And the very next day... I'm not day, even joking, was, by the way. I'm not even joking. This is so not a plan. I didn't know you were going to say that book. Bam, book right here. First one <laughs> on the shelf. Right? Hardcover, too. Um... I really, I had no idea you were going to bring that one up because I didn't. I thought you were talking about some of the other kids. Um, yeah, this is re that's ridiculous. I mean, those kids. I know you sent me the story about the uh, some of these kids. These kids, when they find out about these books, they fight for them and they put the word out there. And I mean, who doesn't love that? Yeah, absolutely. And that's you know that's what Banned Books Week is all about. It's about having the courage to really stand up for 
you know, hey, keep your hands off my intellectual freedom. So it's cool. Hey, speaking of, we just got a um, a question on the line. Uh, why is Banned Books Week important to you, and do you have a favorite banned book? Um, I do. You know, listen, at the end of the day, um, what banned books are about is not what shouldn't be said, but what that, you know, what should be said, and and it's about freedom, right? I mean, not to just pull out the, the the word that that gets us the most emotional, but um, it is about our freedom of speech. It's about our freedom of expression, and you know, there's a there's a place, uh, you know, there are places all across this country where what you write can get you killed, and if that happens, right? What that is when democracy is lost, and when you lose that, you don't. It's not that you lose stories or that you lose sales or that you lose, you know, things like that. But what you lose are ideas, and what you lose are, are you know, things that move people and things that can change people. Um, to me, that's what it means to me. As for my favorite band book, um, you know, Charles, you sent me the list. I'll tell you two. You know what? I'm not joking. I didn't even. <laughs> I forgot. This, actually, this is crazy. This. This, by the way, is actually, this is my favorite fan book, um, and you probably don't recognize it, but it's Watchmen. It's not just Watchmen, it's the actual, this was given to me by Dave Gibbons and Alan Moore, the actual script. Of wow. The first um, here's the typewritten script, and um, this is, it. first of all, love Alan Moore typing like, you know, crazy man, just straight down the page. Um, no indentations, nothing. Um... You know, and this is what you, I mean, you just got to read it. Ready? All right, I'm psyched up. I've got blood up to my elbows, veins in my teeth, and my helmet and knee pads securely fastened. Welcome to Watchmen. Um, this is my favorite band book. It's always been my favorite book. It's the easy answer, but it's true. Um, but you know what my other favorite band book is? It's a number, you know what the number one band book was in the past year? It was Captain Underpants. That was like the most requested book that they want in the library. And actually, uh, maybe like five years ago, when my son was just, we're kind of figuring out how to read. Um, he didn't really care about regular books. He has kind of a visual brain like me. And um, and his school sent home a thing that said, comic books do not count when it comes to reading. And I was like, and not just because I write comics, but I just was like, that's wrong. So the first thing I did is I went to try and find comics he could read. And it said, and nothing like Ca Captain Underpants. That doesn't count because it's sophomore. Um, and Dave Pike is not sophomore to me. Those books are incredible. And you know why they're incredible? Because my son, when he read them, we laughed out loud together reading them, and he was obsessed, and he was like, I want to read another. And it was the first book he ever read where he was like, I want to read another. And that is amazing to me. So the idea that they would ban something like that, because it, whether it's rude to teachers or because it has the word underpants in it, um, that's just ridiculous. I mean, anything that creates more reading is a good thing. That that's exactly right. And actually, you know, we have this great resource that we created called Raising a Reader: How Comics and Graphic Novels Can Help Your Kids Love to Read. And it was pre created by uh, Meryl Jaffe, PhD. And it is it addresses that idea, like comics are candy. You know, comics are reward reading; they're not real reading. And that's just inherently false. You know, we live in a visual century. And so your example about your son going to this and going, you know, this is something that you know I want to read. I want to dive in. You know, there's all kinds of literacy, and comics are just a great segue into that. So it's uh, it's great to see teachers, um, you know, standing up for that. It's great to see parents standing up for that. Yep, for sure. Huh? So somebody just asked, is there anything that should be banned, in your opinion? Um, you know, listen, when you, I think it's just like the First Amendment, right? You can't scream, uh, fire in a crowded movie theater. Um, it doesn't mean that anything, you know, I, I think if you're, if you're using it to hurt somebody, um, you know, I think if you're using it to, to, uh, you know, really go after someone and do them physical or, or even mental harm on purpose, and that's the only reason it exists, like, yeah, that's not exactly what is going to be on my shelf behind me. Um, and, you know, there, there's laws for that. You know, there's slander laws, there's libel laws, and, you know, there's parts of speech that are already unprotected, but... Offensive speech, you know, that is protected, and it's up to the marketplace of ideas to kind of say, that's offensive and here's why, not that's offensive, please take it away. That's right, right? I mean, I may not like what you write, but I will defend your right to it. We all know the book. Cool. Uh, Ellen York just writes in, uh, my son loved, learned to love reading with Captain Underpants in a series of unfortunate events. So uh, thank you, Ellen, for sharing that. 
Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the thing is, is again, um, to me, uh, you know, more readers is a better society. It just is. It's just a fact. This isn't like a, a bold statement that I'm making here. It's not like anyone's out there and being like, no, we want less reading, no, we're society. Um, but the one, the number one comment I got on Twitter today, and that people were emailing me, and even on Facebook, they were like, people still ban books. They just forget. Like, you know, ban book week is about the fact that we forget. And listen, it's not like, you know, Nazi time where we're having bonfires and pulling out all the books and putting them in there. Um, but you forget that, you know, they're Harry Potter and all the, you know, my friend Jody Picot today tweeted, like, that her book was banned. I mean, to, to me, that's the great badge of honor. But we can't forget that that still goes on. There, you know, anyone watching this right now, probably in their town, it's not happening. But there are towns all over the country where people are doing just that, and they're trying to go through the library and say, you know what, um, you know, she's a witch. She's a witch, and uh, I just you, you cannot allow that. Uh, Jeff Hayes writes in: How do we get varied literacies, e.g., comics that can be applied to 21st century learning into the curriculum? So, how do we get more types of literacy into the curriculum? Um, you know, I get letters from teachers all the time. Um, I, when I did Identity Crisis for DC Comics, um, it won an American Library Association award for for teen graphic novels. And um, the number one, they told me that the number one growing part of libraries right now are graphic novels. It's pretty amazing. Um, so I think you get them by asking for them. I mean, go to your library and tell them that's what you want. They, what they do is they have budgets, and they have to decide what they're going to buy. They can't buy everything. Um, and so the more vocal you are about it, the more you'll get, which I think is a good thing. Um, and, you know, I always say ask for more of my books because that's how we're going to get more of them. Cool. I know I did that. Yes, as you should. Actually, you know, speaking of asking, and I'm sorry to do the infomercial bit, but um, right now the fund is doing our Be Counted campaign, which is our membership drive that we run every fall. And this year we're giving back to your community, so when you join the fund, um, we will help out your library by sending them either copies of our Raising the Reader Guide or our Manga Guide, which is designed to help out when... You know, librarians are trying to collect the category, where do I start? And so we are creating these tools uh, to help out in that area. So please do check that out. Um, infomercial over. Let's go back to the questions. Kristen, is there anything coming through on Twitter? Sure. Um, let's see here. This, Andrew Rollins just wrote in, and he said that... Um, Reading comics helps him overcome a disability, um, specifically dyslexia. Have you encountered um, any other stories where reading comics has kind of um, tapped into um, an avid readership for others that might be suffering from um, some of these disabilities as well? I got nothing on that. Charles, you know of any, anyone that you've encountered? Well, everybody finds, I, I hear a lot of stories about people that find strength in comics, and I fe find a lot of stories about, um, you know, people that overcome bullying because of the messages in comics, or people that overcome, um, you know, just just um, find the courage. Like, we did an um, event with um, Jeff Johns uh, at the end of his Green Lantern run, and a fellow move, uh, wrote very movingly that he was diagnosed with cancer, and he was facing this horrible fear of going into treatment. He was facing this horrible fear of the unknown, of just being a young man dealing with this crippling disease and dealing with the fact that his life might be cut short. And he said that he went to Jeff's work and Jeff's no fear message gave him the strength to help move forward. And so comics are inspiring because, you know, it taps into that emotional space and because it creates heroes we can believe in, whether it's, you know, Green Lantern in the guys that Jeff wrote him, or whether it's Abe in the guys that uh, you and Chris are writing him. It's it's a really powerful medium that taps right into our emotional core. So there's there's a lot to lot to be said for it. And, yeah, you know... That, that, I, I mean, that I will say, um, you know, again, I don't have the physical side, but I think on the emotional side, um, I'll speak for myself personally. Forget about even saying how many people have come up to me and told me those stories. Um, but I don't, you know, I think I, we all want to say when we say, oh, when we talk about morality, we want to talk about, you know, big books. We want to say, oh, I read Moby Dick or I read the Bible or, you know, books that kind of give, attribute, get, get that attribute more. Um, for me, it really was uh, comic books where 
was the first morality play that most of us read, right? We, we don't want to, we, we rarely acknowledge it. Um, but when we look at good and bad, before you're picking up the Bible, when you're a little kid, you're reading comics, you're, you're looking at, and that's where you're seeing good fight evil. Um, and I know we don't all wear our underwear on the outside of our pants, although I do often. In fact, right now I am. But, but the truth is, is that um, that morality matters. It teaches people things, and it, and it teaches, you know, I, I can speak for myself, it's taught me right from wrong. I mean, I still to this day feel like the people that I encounter, especially in comics and in work in comics, have a really amazing sense of, of right and wrong and generosity. And I don't just think it's a coincidence. I think it's, you know, you commit yourself to 20 and 30 years of, of reading about this all the time, not just about the nuances or anything else, but just good versus evil, you know, what is good and what is evil and trying to define them. And I feel like the industry struggles with that. Um, and I know it's, of course, weave my way into my novels. Um, but I think for me, that's absolutely where it, where it started. Uh, Andrew Lancaster uh, writes in, I'm sorry, Jeremy Gill writes in, uh, what is your favorite historical time period? Uh, you know, that's a good one. I mean, I think there's a part of me that just would, you know, I think um, is fascinated with World War II. I think that's fascinated with, you know, seeing my parents when I'm young and playing Back to the Future. I mean, there's all the things that I'm fascinated with. But I don't think anything for me beats revolutionary times. I don't think anything for me beats George Washington and watch it go. Abraham Lincoln's close because Abraham Lincoln is one of the few people that, after researching his life, lives up to the hype. But it, you know, it's still one person. I, I just think Thomas Jefferson, you know, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, the you know these guys were like you know hardcore original American badass. Um, and even you know just watching. Um, uh, you know, Abigail Adams. I mean, you know, there's founding fathers, but there's founding mothers too. And, you know, she used to melt her forks down to, to, you know, into bullets in her own fireplace and then turned her living room into a hospital. I mean, these are amazing times fighting for the existence of who we are with an army that's underserved and not wearing shoes and doesn't have, the, you know, the weapons and still coming and fighting that. Uh, that just does it for me. I, you know, that, that, that kind of gives me my, my nerd excitement for the day. And, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about your body of work in this area is that you're reaching into the past and you're finding examples of heroism and making them speak and resonate to 21st century audiences, both of young and older readers. And so could you speak a little bit to the technique of how you can dust off these old books and make them beat strongly into the hearts of modern readers? Yeah, you know, I... I think it is like the Supreme Court definition of pornography, which is, you know, when you see it, you just know, like when you read some of these old stories, you just read it and you go, that is just, you know, it's awesome. I mean, I had a, again, finding out that George Washington had his own secret spy ring uh, during the Revolutionary War that no one knew about. And then he used this spy ring to help win the Revolutionary War. And he used regular people because all of his generals and all the military guys, you know, they were known by the British. They were obviously former British guys. Everyone knows who they are. But to find out that he used ordinary citizens, and why? Because no one looks twice at an ordinary person. That is just amazing to me. And the idea that, you know, I can say, wait a minute, what if you found out that George Washington's spy ring existed to this very day? Um, and to have someone say to me, what makes you think it doesn't? Uh, that's it. I mean, I, that to me is where it comes alive. But, but again, I, I think I can give you all my answers for the, what the trick is or how I do it or what I see. But I actually think it's also more interesting to look at the appetite for it. I think we're a country right now that is starving for heroes. I think we're starving for it. I think, you know, if you look at the zeitgeist, um, and I've said this before, but if you look at, like, what just even superheroes and, and cartoon characters, I should say, were popular in the Great Depression, it was Flash Gordon and it was Tarzan, characters that were designed to transport you elsewhere. And then as World War II was encroaching on our shores and it's 1938, um, and we're starting to get scared as a country. Who comes along but a character known as Superman? And suddenly Superman's here to save us, dressed in a flag to save the United States. And if you look at 9-11, right after 9-11 happened, and the country was terrified again, what was the first movie that broke through the public consciousness? Back when they were saying, you know, irony's dead and no one will laugh again and it's all over, the first movie that broke through the public consciousness was Spider-Man. We were once again a country starving for heroes. And if you look at you know, the last presidential elections. We're not looking for politicians. We're looking for saviors. And I think that it exists. It's why every superhero movie today, even the terrible ones, are making hundreds of millions of dollars. 
um, you know, just because we are we are as a country are just looking for that. That appetite is there, and I think that you know it goes hand in hand with you know trying to make your things work, but also acknowledging what's out there and what people want. Um, and what I what again personally, I want I want those heroes. Um, I want to tell their stories. I wish they were here to save us. Hey, Brad, what are some of the I values? That, what are some of the values that you think we're starving for um, right now? Um, you know, I just think I think part of it is just common decency. Um, I think it's humility. I think it's the basics. You know, we're missing the bread and butter today in the country. I think that you know we look around the politicians and we shake our heads and you know we we say you know what who would even want to be president anymore? Is that something we used to we want to even have anymore? It used to be when I was growing up, right? I mean, not to sound like the old fart, but, you know, people used to be like, you wanted to grow up to be president. Now they say, you know, if you could be president or Beyonce's assistant, which would you be? And the average kid picks Beyonce's assistant. Um, or you look at politicians, I mean, there's no sense of humility. There's no sense of working together. I mean, I think we have a country that, that understands we're all different, but we can find common ground. And yet we have politicians who have want no part in that. They just want to fist fight. They want to throw mud. They want to, you know, hate each other and just make culture wars. And, and I don't think that represents where America is. I, I can tell you. I, I mean, um, and I think we have to get back to that. And to me, I know it sounds silly. You know, it used to be a hero would, you just wanted someone who could fly or someone who could deflect bullets or someone who could turn invisible. And the superpower, you know, I, I wish people had today was, again, just humility and decency. Kristen? Sure. I have Sharon Beaven here that asks, uh, who are some of your heroes, Brad? Uh, you know, when I did these books called Heroes for My Son and Heroes for My Daughter and filled it with my favorite heroes. So I have a hundred of them that come to mind, uh, but I'll talk about two. Um, one is, of course, my mother, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago. And every day that I sit down to write, I'm in my home office right now. This is where I work. And every day I sit down to write, um, I think back to the moment uh, when I told my mom my second book wasn't working out and I lost my contract and it was all falling apart and everything was a disaster and I called my mom up and I said, Mom, it's a disaster and she said to me, I'd love you if you were a garbage man. And she didn't care, you know, whether, and she wasn't taking a crack at garbage man. My uncle was a garbage man in Brooklyn. But she was just saying, I don't care if you're the king of England or anything else, I'd love you. Um, so my mom will always have that spot in my heart. But the other one, and I think it's important for Band Books Week, um, is my teacher, my English teacher, Ms. Sheila Spicer. And I tell this story in honor of all the teachers out there because they are on the really the true front lines of, of putting books in kids' hands and watching what people do and, and in some cases, you know, making sure and fighting that fight, helping them fight that fight, especially with those young heroes, Charles, you were talking about earlier. Um, and Ms. Spicer was that teacher who was the first teacher who ever told me I can write. And I said, well, people can write. She said, no, you know what you're doing. She said, and she tried to put me in the honors class. She couldn't get me in the honors class. So what she said is, you're going to sit in this corner for the entire year, ignore every homework assignment I give, ignore everything I'm going to do. You're going to do the honors work. And, and what she was really saying was, you're going to thank me later. And 10 years later, when my first book was published, I went back to her classroom and I knocked on the door and um, she said, can I help you? And um, I said, my name is Brad Meltzer and I wrote this book and it's for you. And I handed it to her and she started crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, because I didn't think I was having an impact anymore. And I said, crazy we have three students we have one you know one teacher um, and she actually lasted 12 years she retired last year I went to her retirement party and I'll never forget it you know when you go to the retirement party you're risking all your emotions right there all your memories because if you go back and she's not as great as you remember everything falls apart emotionally for you and I go back and it's a Friday night she's retiring I wanted to surprise her she didn't know I was coming I was hiding in the corner and all she has to do is get up in front of all these teachers and say you know what I like half of you, I hate the other half of you, it's Friday night, goodbye, nice, have a nice life. And instead she gets up in front of all these teachers and she says, for all of you who say that the kids have changed and it's gotten harder, I'm going to tell you right now, you are getting old and you are getting lazy. Do not give up on these kids, do not give up on these kids. And she gives a speech, it's like the rallying cry from Braveheart. And it was so amazing, so emotional, and um, and that to me is a pretty darn good hero. One of the things that is um, interesting about your work, particularly the hero series in, and the story you just told, is this ethic of paying it forward, this ethic of taking what has inspired us in our lives and made a difference and then taking that energy and paying it forward to the, the generation that's coming up. And so you are a best-selling author, you are a TV host, 
you can pay it forward from these platforms that you have. How can those of us in the audience, you know, pay it forward in our everyday lives? You know, there's a the, the book. What well, you know, the book Wonder by R.J. Palacio, and it's just you know, it's a simple message about a kid with a deformed face, and um, one of my favorite books I read this year and made my son read it, and uh, and I. I, the, the message of the book is pretty darn simple, and it simply says, choose kindness, right? When you're choosing between being right and being kind, choose kindness. And I don't think there's any difference, Charles, let me be clear, between what I can do and what anyone else can do, right? I, yes, do I have a couple more Twitter followers? Like, sure. But I, I don't do things on some massive you know, level that I'm changing the world. To me, you change the world by being kind to one person. Um, and that's it. That's it every day. And I really, I know it. You know, it almost sounds like a, a little, uh, a little, you know, naive or 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 simple. But man, it works, right? I mean, over and over. If you want to, you want to know. Here's the easiest way. I've said it before. Um, is go say thank you. That's it, right? Think of think of someone in your life who gave you your first real job, who told you you were good at something. Think of your Miss Spicer, that that teacher that that said you you know you could do it. Um, think of someone who was just kind to you or did something nice for you at a moment when you really needed it. And when you're done here and you're done listening to me and you, and you shut the computer and, you, and you're and you done watching S.H.I.E.L.D., track them on Facebook, track them down, find them, and say thank you. And you will never believe what comes from it. That is outstanding. And, and speaking of S.H.I.E.L.D., we should start wrapping this up. So uh, let me give you an opportunity to um, tell us what you've got coming out uh, in the next couple weeks. Yeah, but you know, I actually brought. Um, so first, this is out right now in paperback, The Fifth Assassin, and I do have to thank for setting this up. Uh, my publisher, Grand Central, and Hachette um, really helped put this all together. And thank you to Google and to everyone at the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. That, that's where the real thank yous should go. Let's be very clear here. Like, I'm here, but I'm here um, because I believe in the work of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, and I really appreciate Google helping us get your message out. That's far more important than what I'm saying here. Um, so they sponsored this. This I actually brought that no one's seen before. I hate when you do these things and you just hear me, you know, I never want to tell the same stories twice. I'd rather it always be new. This actually no one's seen yet. So let's look at it for the very first time. I just got the copy. Um, this comes out October 22nd. It, our decoded book counts down the top 10 conspiracies of all time. But here's what's cool about it. And no one's seen this yet is when you open it up. So here's like a conspiracy. So here's the one about Confederate gold and where it's hiding. This is actually in the book. You open up the book. There's a secret flap in the book, and there's hidden pages. So here is actually, oh, this is actually cool. This is the secret codes of the Knights of the Golden Circle. And you can actually pull out the evidence from the book. So there's like all these different, you know, here's like a secret letter written, um, and it actually shows the secret code that they use. You can see the code that they actually used on the back. So there's all these cool things in it, and um, I love that we get to do that because it's just, you know, the only thing that's better than a secret decoder ring is like a book with secret compartments in it. Um, and that's basically what I've got coming up. Other than that, um, to me the most important thing, again, is to just say thank you to everyone out there who listens and supports on Twitter. Um, I heard some of the names that came out there were people who I, you know, just are regularly, regularly out there supporting myself, supporting you guys at the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, and uh, I love all of you for doing that. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you folks uh, for tuning in to the uh, first of what will be many Comic Book Legal Defense Fund Hangouts on Air. Please go check out cbldf.org this week and share your Banned Books Week stories. Every week we'll have new content about what's happening across the country for Banned Books Week, and we invite you to be counted and give back to your community with some of the CBLDF's tools for, um, for readers, for librarians, for teachers. So. Thank you all, and uh, I'll give Brad the last word before you, we let you uh, tune over to S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, you know what? I say God bless, go see S.H.I.E.L.D., um, but don't forget um, that we do this for one week, but this is happening all the time. And when you see, uh, you know, you hear these stories, you know what you should do? Take a banned book, go look at the list, and buy an extra copy. Just to say F you to people who are banning it. That, to me, is the message, right? When I find out something's being banned, all I'm going to do is buy another copy. Um, and I love that we get to do that. And you know what? Take that copy, give it to someone, and, and watch their mind explode. One of the books I saw on there is Mouse. Um, you know, I see the books that are on there. And I think we do need to end with this because I, you know, I don't want this to be about me. Here are the top ten books um, that were banned, this, that were challenged this year of 2012. 
It's number 10 is Beloved by Toni Morrison. I mean, ridiculous. The Glass Castle by Jeanette Wall is one of the greatest nonfiction books I've ever read. Um, that talks about her story of, you know, that when she, her mom was homeless. And Jeanette Wallace writes this completely, utterly honest, compelling look at her own life. Um, that that will be on the list. Scary Stories by Alvin Schwartz. Looking for Alaska by John Green. The Kite Runner. Number five is Entango Makes Three. Number four is Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, I, I, don't even, I can't even make the joke here. That's so easy. Um, number three is Thirteen Reasons Why. Number two is The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie, one of the great writers, of course. Um, number one is Captain Underpants by Dave Pikey. Um, that should pretty much tell you where we are as a culture today. Go out and support those books. Go out and buy more copies. Give them to people. Share them. Um, and more important, thank you for supporting uh, BAM Books Week and the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund who are fighting every day, not just for one week, but every day for all of us.